Hello and welcome back. And that is right. Today we're going to do the big one. Today we are looking at Synology DSM 7.2. And in today's video, it's kind of a hybrid review and a before you buy. Things we've run on this channel for a while. And in this video, although we're going to be summarizing a whole lot of Synology's Disk Station Manager version 7.2 as of summer 2023, um, on top of that, I'll be giving you five reasons why you should consider Synology premier software for NAS for you and your data but I will also be giving you five reasons why you might want to sit on the fence a little bit longer those of you that have followed the channel for a while know I've done these for a long time and generally I'm talking about hardware and what makes the day different is this is going to be exclusively about Synology's software if I do make reference to the hardware throughout this video then I will at least let you know but pretty much if a particular feature of DSM can't run on on every Synology NAS, I will let you know something that will become clear in the second half of this video. The second thing I will highlight is right now, I'm on camera, but I'm taking up all kinds of camera space here. And regardless of where in the picture I could put my face, it's going to be in the way of something. So after this point, I'm going to completely remove me from the screen and we're going to focus exclusively on DSM here. So let's crack on with the first main reason to consider Disk Station Manager 7.2 for you and your data. So first and foremost, let's be honest, it's going to be about the applications. Yes, DSM is one of the most fluid app centers out there, and I've got three different NASs here all running DSM that I'm going to be flicking between throughout the course of this video. But ultimately, when it comes to the software, it is just A1. Synology has made a point of replacing a lot of the popular applications a lot of users use in their day-to-day -day lives for email, for communication, for multimedia, for business, and they've created their own versions, ultimately allowing you to have this single ecosystem to run all of your data exchanges for home and for business and that extends not just to the desktop applications of course but if you head over to the download section from Synology's website not only do you have a full range of packages and applications for your NAS you've also got a whole range of desktop applications as well most of which are supported on both Windows and Mac OS, with several of them also supported on Linux clients as well. For example, when you download, you will always see the range of different client desktop uh, tools available to you but it doesn't stop there you've also got mobile applications that range from security to enjoying your multimedia to managing remotely business and home tools all built in for android and of course ios and um, when it comes to the applications themselves of course most home or you know mid-range users are going to enjoy what's commonly referred to as the synology collaboration suite of applications this is apps and services used to share data with your colleagues, family members, or clients. And these range quite like quite extensively. Now, one of the apps I don't think gets anywhere near the attention it does, and it's an odd place to start, but hear me out, it's Synology Chat. This is a replacement to your likes of WhatsApp and, and um, Skype, where you can run a communication channel very easily and installed very quickly from client desktop tools via mobile um, application i'm sorry from desktop uh, browser to all the way along into utilizing ios and android devices to exchange information messages comms all of it from all of your different devices all of them managed all within this Synology ecosystem here of applications. Synology chat often overlooked, but if you're a business or even a family that want to exchange information and messages between one another, it's a great way to do it. And all of that while having access to the data within the NAS. And you can add users as guests and otherwise. You've also got Synology contacts if you want to install and go through your range of existing you know, uh, address books and contacts. You can utilize a lot of the applications for exchanging uh, data on Synology's Drive application to create team folders. Synology Drive allows you to create that single shared storage area using your native file tool. So if you're running you know, Mac OS and you want to use Finder or you're running Windows and you want to use Explorer, you can do it. And from here, you're able to create folders that are on your NAS 
but are being streamed onto your local operating systems file manager. And as you can see here, you're able to see the content of this NAS. We'll go to some really old folders here. You're able to look at old folders that may be here on the NAS, but not stored locally. And if we right click a file here, we're able to see this file 13.5 megs on the NAS, taking up zero space here on my local PC. And these applications run as well, as you can see, if you're running uh, 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 an iOS device, and again, that comes to iPhone or a tablet, you can use Synology Drive on these. Alternatively, you can go ahead over to the Android platform and boom, you have access to Synology Drive to allow that synchronization. And again, this replaces things like Dropbox, Google Drive for that synchronization. Then you've got tools like Synology Photos, which is an AI powered uh, photo application, which allows you to browse your albums with AI supported recognition be it for people that you want to recognize and catalog those faces of decades of photos that you've taken or use the AI now in DSM 7.2 the latest update and the update to Synology Photos for subject recognition where photos will be cataloged based on their contents and although this is a small album just three or four albums that I've uploaded, you may have decades of photos that you can allow this to catalog. And Synology Photos is a fantastic application for managing and sharing your private and public photos that you may have in your collection. Or if you're a professional photographer, create um, synchronized albums from your ongoing projects that you can share with clients. It's very, very easy. And the level of metadata that is contained in a lot of these photos is surprisingly dense. You can go in, find out more information. You can find out the devices that took the photos and more. All of it very easily, all stored within the metadata of those photos, just like you expect from the likes of Google Photos. And then from there, you have things like the multimedia applications of Video Station, an alternative to Plex Media Server with scraping of metadata that allows you to look at your average file, find out more information thanks to the scraping of metadata from things like IMDB and you know, um, beautify your existing collection of multimedia. The same goes for Audio Station, where you can create these fantastic audio collections and manage your audio to be accessed on mobile devices and desktop devices easily, as well as integration with things like um, uh, Alexa from Amazon for you to voice your uh, multimedia. So you can just say aloud, play me the latest Led Zeppelin, which would be a weird sentence. You can do that. And I could go on and on about these applications more and more but ultimately the point I'm making is the sheer range of applications and services for home and business users is extensive and almost certainly there is either an application from Synology themselves that you can utilize to replace an existing third-party one or you can head to the App Center where they're still supporting several third-party applications for remote access for multimedia for business backups and more and all of that available and included on one click installers within dsm 7.2 it's absolutely cracking stuff the range of collaboration suite applications is genuinely in, just incredible. Not only have you got their own Office suite here that will rival the likes of Google Docs and even Microsoft Office in many cases to handling Word Docs, Excel sheets, uh, PowerPoint presentations and more. But on top of that, you've got other tools built into their Office suite of applications such as Synology Calendar as well that allows you to synchronize your existing Outlook Calendar or Google Calendar and have it all working within that single ecosystem there. And if you are a user who is utilizing an existing um, Office 365 or Microsoft 365 or a Google Workspace account, you can utilize tools like Active Backup and Active Backup for uh, Business on 365 and Google Workspace to synchronize all of those existing mail accounts, user accounts, and tools and documents with the Synology NAS, thereby giving you an on-site bare metal alternative to utilizing those third-party cloud-based systems. You can keep using them, but they will synchronize with the NAS as a bare metal backup. And in the event that you lose contact with these cloud services via the internet, you'll still be able to access all of the data natively, which is really, really important on the NAS. And then when the internet connection is re-established, the NAS and these third-party services will resynchronize and re-backup and re um, establish all of that data that's been accrued there in the background. Genuinely an incredible range of applications and services, all of which are included in DSM 7.2.
next up, having all of these wonderful tools to get the job done isn't going to be that useful if what you specifically want the NAS to do is to run as a backup. And if you want to use your Synology NAS to build your robust 3-2-1 backup strategy, so you've got data being migrated and backed up and synchronized across multiple locations to the most effective conclusion possible, there are loads of apps like that in DSM 7.2. If we start at the bottom rung of the ladder and go basic, you've got USB backup tools that allow you to connect USB devices to your Synology NAS and either have instantaneous triggered uh, backups as soon as the drive connects or more tailored scheduled ones with retention policies and more. So for example, if we do a test policy here, um, we've spelt test ROM, but we're going to commit to it. We select an area of that drive really, really quickly. OK, test files from there. Select a destination on the NAS. We'll go for video. Select that. We can go for multi-versioning, mirroring, or incremental. We've got different kinds of controls and policies. Whether you want a rotation policy, where the backup will either be a new one kept every time, overwriting the oldest one. From there, you can choose whether you want the USB to immediately disconnect or permanently have it connected to run it on a scheduled time, or copy the data as soon as the drive is connected. From there, select what kind of files you want to include or not include, and, e and even include filtered policies towards files format and as you can see I've already ran one remember all of those retention policies later now scaling up you then use something like hyper backup hyper backup creates a much of all of the policies you've seen thus far imagine including all of those not only to USB drives but to cloud storage remote NAS storage and within the NAS as well so if we create a new policy for example and we want to create a new backup you can look at all the different kinds of backup destination that are possible here so for example if we went ahead again with uh, going to a remote local uh, remote NAS we can go ahead with the remote NAS select next and just enter the uh, connection policies of that NAS on top of that as you can see we've also got local storage and cloud storage we've got a few different cloud platforms supported there in order to back up the data to and from the NAS on those cloud platforms and again all of these with those same retention policies we talked about rotation policies file filters and more and you can edit these very very easily on the fly changing what is and isn't happening with these backups as well as the schedules and more very very easily and you can alter those rules and adapt them at any time now if you're running cloud storage you can go ahead if you choose to connect one of your uh, existing cloud supported storage from third-party providers subscription or otherwise or Synology's own c2 service and attach and synchronize that storage drive very very easily and in doing so it means that when you go into browsing the files and folders on the NAS you can add those existing storage areas to be accessed by the NAS and um, cloud synchronized and that allows those um, backed up files and folders to be synchronized onto the NAS it's not the same as um, streaming kind of bolted on phantom storage for that we have to look up another application known as hybrid share and what this does is create an area of shared space on Synology C2 storage space and makes the NAS utilize it as if it was locally accessed thereby giving you an area of storage that you can have on the NAS system synchronized with their cloud storage that you can access via the cloud access via the NAS and give you that multi-purpose access you can even nice and simply go straight into the C2 portal from Synology and deal with the storage there then you get to the big guns when you want the big guns that is when you look at active backup for business again this is an included application with all Synology now systems that support or have the hardware more on that later for active backup and this allows you to back up another NAS something we've done right now where we've connected these two NAS systems utilizing the backup agent application on one NAS and the uh, active backup handling tool here on this Synology NAS here you can utilize the same thing to back up a whole operating system level backup of your NAS a third party server a standard file server or even virtual machines and the virtual machines and more on that later on it on some supported file formats can also be injected into the virtual machine manager later on we'll talk about that and host them locally giving you a bare metal hypervisor for those cloud VMs 
So we have a whole host of different means that we can attach our st uh, storage and synchronize our storage across multiple sites very, very easily between our NAS systems and all of that hosted and included within your Synology DSM system. And if all you wanted to do was synchronize your storage locally, then you can just simply use the Synology Assistant that is included uh, in the download section from Synology and then utilizing this tool, you can go ahead straight away Pick the NAS of choice, right click, and you can map a drive if you choose to access the contents of that NAS very easily. The way you go in will differ depending on your own uh, operating system of choice. But once again, this gives you the ability to bolt on storage very quickly, very easily to your local system. As you can see here, click next. It's all attached. And now on my local system, if I go into the list of available drives, there is our new cloud drive. And again, I can access everything that's on that NAS locally on my local operating system. And again, you can manage all of those backups with that, as well as using the likes of Synology Drive to really get the job done well. And all of that being configurable, either for synchronization or backups. It really is unparalleled, the sheer scale of backup and synchronized options included with Synology DSM 7.2. Now we've talked about apps, we've talked about backup and integrity and 3 to one backup strategies there at the front, but what about the back end? Now I want to talk about redundancy, I want to talk about safety nets, and ultimately I want to talk about the safeguards and restoration methodology that's built into DSM 7.2 in the background. For example, here is our storage manager here, and as you can see, although this is a four bay NAS, we've only got two drives inside, so we can expand that storage very easily at any time we like, and if we choose to, we can go to one of these available pools we can go ahead and expand it really really easily we can go ahead and add drives we can replace it very very easily to these existing storage pools very very easily by just clicking one of these and adding them and creating a new pool there's our list of all those drives manage a drive go down create a storage pool and boom we can create a new storage pool with the added benefit of Synology Hybrid RAID. For those aren't aware, Synology Hybrid RAID, SHR, allows you to mix and match drives. It means that if you are running a configuration like this one, where you've got a couple of drives here, and later down the line you want to start adding more drives, Synology Hybrid RAID will allow you to use larger hard drives. Traditional RAIDs won't let you do that. If you choose to, you can still go ahead and use a regular RAID if you like. And it supports all of the additional RAIDs depending on the size of the NAS you're using. But still, nevertheless, that is a great feature that's built into this system. And selecting drives is quick, easy, and it's done with very little fuss. Now, on top of that, you've got support of things like SSD caching. SSD caching there at the bottom, which allows you to speed up the access to data lovely and easily. You will need SSDs to get the job done, and then as you use it, will change things. But again, SHR has been, uh, sorry, not SHR, SSD caching has been in Synology NAS for a long time, and DSM 7.2 has really made the most of it. But what's new in DSM 7.2 for some systems is the ability to also use SSDs for storage pools. That's right, we can create ourselves a brand new storage pool if we choose using those SSDs. You will have to go in via a specific portal to do so, but depending on the NAS you use, and again, NAS is like the DS920 here do not support it, whereas the DS923 does. It's still going to be very useful and very appealing to those of you that want that faster storage. But just bear in mind at the time of recording, you can only use Synology's own SSDs to create storage pools right now in DSM 7.2. Now, moving forward from that storage, we can talk about some of the background stuff that's pretty darn impressive about this. So for example, if we look at this already created storage pool and have a little look at the settings, we look at some of the fun options. So for example, we have the option, if we choose to, to create an encrypted vault on certain storage volumes. On top of that, we can go ahead, if we choose, to create the fast repair protocol if we want. So in the event that one of our drives dies and we replace it with a new drive, as per what you would expect from RAID technology with multiple drives, Fast Repair allows you the RAID to only have to build the areas of space on the disk where the data originally lived. If that was off, 
when we do a RAID rebuild in the event of a drive failing and installing a new drive, it would have to build the drives completely, even the empty sectors. Fast Repair allows you to only have to worry about the areas where there was data, so if you had um, a 10 terabyte storage area where a drive failed and you were rebuilding, but you only ever had one TB on there, Fast Repair will allow you to get away with only using a single terabyte of drive rebuild time, and then it just zeroes out the rest of the drive. There's loads of fun settings like that. And then when we move to the front end for a lot of users, and for that, most users are either going to be interacting with shared folders, they're going to be uh, interacting with the file station area, or they're going to be interacting with snapshots there when it comes to recovery and restoration. These are going to be the three key areas. So as mentioned earlier on, there is the file station area where you can, via the web browser or via those mobile applications and desktop applications we mentioned, interact with your data, not just the web browser. Now, if we do want to create a new storage area, one of the things that's pretty cool that we can do is create immutable backups. That is data that cannot be deleted, or at least can only be deleted or changed by a system admin. And it's really straightforward. We click create, we create our new shared folder. That new shared folder we give a name. We say a location on the notes where we want it to be. Click next. And straight away, we can choose if we want to equip write once, otherwise known as worm, write once, read many. And this allows you to create a storage area, or if you choose, you can encrypt it just like we showed you earlier on um, with the pools. And from there, not the pools, the volumes, click next. And from here, you've got those options of different modes. Enterprise modes means that you create this, any date that goes in there can only be deleted, deleted or destroyed by an admin. And compliance mode means that no one can get rid of it and that means you can create truly immutable backups that in the event of a ransomware attack means that that data cannot be changed so on top of that you've got auto lock that allows you to create set periods of time where the data can be changed or deleted before the locks come down alternatively a period of retention where the data cannot be changed until this period has gone by it's undeniably a great way to do it and although a lot of other brands have instituted worm right once read many before synology i think they've done it in an incredibly user-friendly way i'm not overly keen on the way they utilize the encryption key locations um you know, but more on that if you watch my encryption and worm test video but nevertheless this is a great feature rolled into dsm 7.2 that's arguably long overdue again you can utilize snapshots as well that create blueprints of your data over a certain period of time, as you can see here. And these uh, snapshots allow you to look at a folder and we can go back and go to the restore points in their timeline. So select a folder. If we go to the, let's go for this one here, we'll go for that. And then we can go into the 19 restore points there, select recover, and we can go through and select an older restoration point if we choose to see if we can go back to an earlier version of a file remember retention policies remember recovery and all of that is built in with every copy of dsm 7.2 however later on i'll explain why some of those features are not going to be available in some nazis that aren't as powerful Another absolute 10 out of 10 killer app that's included with the Synology NAS that I really do think in DSM 7.2 should stand on its own, hence why I've not included it with all the other apps, is Surveillance Station. Surveillance Station is by far one of the best surveillance applications I've ever used. And although I'm going to be skirting over a lot of the details right now, I already did a massive review on this, going through all of its features from its e-mapping all the way through to different mobile applications, some of the AI-related stuff, multi-angle feeds, and all of that is linked in this 35-minute dedicated review just to this application here that I recommend you check out rather than me going over it twice in this video but ultimately while we're looking at that feed there from that review that even gives you an idea of just the level of sophistication and control afforded to that and this was utilizing an intel celeron powered nas here now 
As you can see here on screen, I'm running two camera. Uh, well, it looks like I'm running two cameras, but it's actually the same camera twice in this feed. So, for example, if we click play there, we'll be able to see not only are both of those clocks showing slightly different times, but when I walk away from the camera. You can see that the left camera, that even though it's the same feed, we're running two cameras from different times of day. And that feed can be absolutely enormous. And you can run huge amounts of cameras all within this single feed running in the web browser. Or, once again, utilizing many of the client applications that you can download for your desktop application. Or using um, several of the mobile apps available. There is, of course, the standard surveillance application that allows you to access and manage your Synology surveillance NAS or utilizing live cam that allows you to turn your Synology, um, uh, sorry, your camera on your phone, your Android or iOS camera into a camera that's accessible from the surveillance station application. And it doesn't stop there. The sheer range of features and services included in this are mind boggling. We already talked about the maps application. It allows you to add geolocational information and data for maps on your camera. But on top of that, if you choose, you can go ahead into the app center there and have a look at all the other features and applications that are included that can be installed in Synology surveillance station application controls of IP devices such as doors and speakers and IO modules for direct interfaces smart time lapse that allows you to create much faster feeds of hours and days and weeks of footage to be compressed very very quickly and browse through um, existing recordings very very quickly then you've got tools like transaction device simulators video conversions tools integrity checks for a lot of the recordings you make all of this all of it is included with your Synology NAS in DSM 7.2. You get two camera licenses. And if you want more cameras, you've got to add more licenses. They go for about 30 or 50 nicker a pop. But again, the surveillance application from Synology is enormous. And then you've got things like C2 surveillance that allow you to back up uh, or live back up camera footage that's getting sent to your NAS onto your area of space on the C2 surveillance cloud. You can even use, in some cases, SD cards that are built into your Synology, uh, sorry, into your camera to create edge recordings where <clears throat> the camera is recording to the NAS but also recording to an SD card inside the camera in the event that you need it as failover or in the event that someone cuts the network or steals the NAS or vice versa. Then you've got home mode. Home mode allows you to create this net around your home where every single camera that's on that local area network that is sharing the same connection is kind of authenticated by your phone. Now what that means in real terms is you can have a recording pattern for multiple cameras dotted around your home. And with it, rather than having them on a schedule of on or off, you can have it so the minute you leave your house and your phone leaves the Wi-Fi network of that home and you go to work, go to the shop, pick up your kids from school, as soon as you do that, all the cameras will turn on and they'll turn off as soon as you walk into the house. And this whole thing with geofencing can be enabled either on a schedule or permanently at your own needs. Again, what you're seeing is an incredibly responsive NAS. And this is a 2020 release now as well, the DS720 Plus, the run surveillance station like a dream. Again, I strongly recommend you find out more in my video that goes into way more detail about this from different cameras to using watermarks to using masks. It's all built in there and I go into a vast amount of detail about this. But the big takeaway here is when it comes to DSM 7.2, surveillance station on its own for many users is going to be worth the price of admission on its own. Finally, let's wrap things up with virtual environments. Did you know that in Synology DSM 7.2, not only have you got everything I've discussed thus far, you've also got an incredibly impressive virtual machine tool. This is a hypervisor tool that allows you to create 
virtual machines that can be accessed remotely over the network uh, or remotely over the internet. And these can be scaled extraordinarily depending on the hardware or the NAS you choose to use them in. And again, it's very, very easy to set one up. And again, they kept things as chewable and as user friendly as possible. So straight away, you can choose to create a new VM, choose your OS of choice. So we want to go for Linux. So we want to go for something Ubuntu. -y. From there, select the storage on the NAS that you want to use. Give it a name. From there, the number of CPU cores you want to assign. Again, if you are using a NAS that's using uh, lots of threads, like the AMD Ryzen's, then you've got virtual threads as well. But say we give it one core. How much memory do we want to give it? Let's say we give it a gig. We can say what kind of priority we want to give it, but all of that we can come back to later. From there, give it some space. 350 gig from there click next say which network do you want to use the existing nas network if you wanted to be able to talk to the nas and other devices this virtual machine <coughs> can talk to everything else apologize for the cough there or you can create a brand new network if you choose from there choose the os file you want to use so you can go ahead if you choose if you've already got a virtual machine disk you want to use it's as straightforward as finding it and going ahead and assigning it this digital disk rather than a physical optical disk, you can do that. So I can go ahead, there's an Ubuntu disk, choose if we want to install an additional file, and indeed Synology even supply a guest CD if you want to use that's full of drivers that you can download and have ready to go here on your VM. Auto start, what kind of firmware BIOS do you want to run, what's your keyboard selection going to be running, whether you want to use a, a USB keyboard connected to one of the available USB ports on your existing NAS system. From there, click next. Say which users that have got access to your NAS can use it. And again, all of that can be configured very easily here on the control panel. And then from there, you can just go ahead, select a user, click next. And it's like that. Click done and you'll create that VM. And then you end up with very easily, depending on the disk you choose, a VM that's immediately accessible directly from that IP. Now, if things get even more interesting, as mentioned earlier on, if you're running those virtual um, machines from third-party handlers. So say you were going to utilize the active backup for Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace and some of the VM data lived in there, you can pull some of that over to host those VMs. But that's not really the same thing, is it? What you're curious about more, I would believe, is when you're using things like VMware and Hyper-V and you can manage those hypervisors, synchronize those virtual cloud-based hypervisors with your bare metal NAS and not only back them up using active backup mentioned earlier for business but on top of that they can be pulled over and hosted from within the VM manager you'll just need to import them from those VMs that you've already backed up onto and synchronized with the NAS the sheer scope of configuration whether you're using multiple NASes, multiple storage areas, multiple networks, or downloading different kinds of image, some of which you can convert. And again, that guest tool we mentioned earlier on, all of which can be pulled, managed, and deployed within this virtual machine tool here. Again, built into and included with the price of D. SM. And once you go down the route of high availability, where you've got multiple VMs to, um, running across, if you've got a VM running on multiple systems or using Synology's own high availability to bridge physically multiple Synology NASes together, you really do have an insanely um, robust virtual machine deployment platform. But what about those of you that want to use containers? Containers, unlike a whole virtual machine operating system, containers you can think of as individual applications. And thanks to a combination of Synology and Docker working together, you have access to deploying Dockers, uh, deploying containers in DSM extraordinarily easily. Head down to the registry. Go ahead and find a VM on there. If we go for, just type in a word, we'll put in the word photos. We can select one from here. And then from there, we can download it or open it up in the Docker Hub to find out more information about it. Download it. It will then apply and start to arrive in your existing image directory here. We've already downloaded the Plex Docker application there. Lovely and easy. And if updates arrive, they will appear then. You can set that out with your notification area. And it's as simple as that. Then create your brand new container. 
give it a name, choose which Docker images you're downloading and utilizing, hardware utilization, and then it walks you through the setup process, which port you want it to use, um, what files, folders, configurations, and rules you want to set. All of that can be done using proprietary applications, or in some cases like this, an application that is a hybrid Synology and Docker based tool. I could really go on about the user friendly nature of DSM. I could talk about a lot of the security protocols that can be utilized for controlling how and what can enter the system. We can change the login portal to be unique. You can change a lot of the security services when people are accessing this device, two-step authentication, Synology's own access rules. Hell, we could use their own security tool which allows you to analyze the health and security of your system at the touch of a button to make sure the system is as secure as possible. And when there are weak passwords, when there are things on the network that aren't secure enough, when there are updates for applications that still need addressing, this tool will allow it. There is just an enormous range of apps and tools all presented in possibly the most user-friendly way possible for network attached storage all within DSM 7.2. How? ever it is not perfect and although i've talked a lot about the good things about dsm that i like it's now time to talk about the five things in dsm that aren't for everyone that's just the way it is Probably one of the biggest criticisms that DSM 7.2 and indeed DSM 7 and 7.1 that came before it have received have been changes in Synology's approach towards storage media compatibility. And predominantly, this has really spiked in recent times in two very key areas. Probably the most common one that most people are interacting and finding out about is to do with a sudden change of theirs about 18 to 24 months ago on hard drive and SSD compatibility. Now, for the main base, as you can see here, in this system, I've got a bunch of different drives. I've got some WDs and I've got some Seagates. And I've already created that storage pool there if, with these available drives. Now, if I go in and start creating a new storage pool, so we'll create a new storage pool. Go and click Next. We're going to create an SHR. We'll click Next. And as you can see, we have two drives, both of which are Seagate hard drives here. So let's go ahead, and I've got a 20 TB Seagate drive here. Click Next. And this is where the problems for some users begin. It is the fact that Synology is warning you that you are using a drive that is not on their compatibility list, and therefore it's subject to question marks regarding its compatibility. Now, We'll open up that compatibility list there. But from there, you can still go ahead and create that storage pool. You can go all the way through to conclusion and create that storage pool easily there. So what's the big deal? Well, because when you're utilizing drives that aren't on the recommended compatibility list, it will produce these little orange markers. And if you're a system admin that's installing on behalf of someone else... What you don't want is them getting back to you later on saying you're using or you set up a device for them that wasn't using the right drives. And that's a DS920. That's a NAS from several years ago. But what about the DS923, a much more recent NAS release? Well, let's go ahead and create ourselves a storage pool if we have an available drive. So let's go create ourselves a storage pool. This time we're using a 10TB WD Ultrastar drive that was released way before the DS923 was launched. And once again, we're seeing that same warning there. So we come out of that there. And we talked about this several times in the past in different videos where we've been talking about different kinds of DSM. In an article, we've been breaking down drives that are and aren't compatible. Indeed, we even spoke to Tom over at Lawrence Systems about what exactly is Synology doing with this position. Now, if we look at the DS923 here, we can see that Synology have listed a lot of their own hard drives there. And if we head over to third-party drives and we look at the range of supported third-party drives, we can see that there's, you know, a decent page number there. But if we type in and search for the word Seagate, we can see 15 drives are available on that list there. Some for surveillance and a bunch for NAS, none of which are Iron Wolf Pro drives. And certainly if we look at the capacity, they cap at 16 TB, even though now we're seeing even 22 TB drives in discussion. When we go to the old generation devices, go to third party drives, the list is significantly bigger on that older one. And what we're seeing is we're going to even newer releases like the DS423 Plus that was released you know, around two months ago, but we're seeing that list get smaller and smaller. 
going all the way down there when we look for the word Seagate. Oh no, they have increased those drives to at least include the surveillance drives. But still nonetheless, we are seeing drops in the full range of drive numbers supported on these systems. And this is something we're seeing happening more and more. And if we make things even narrower and look at, say, the DS223J, a new entry-level system here, we can see that not only does Synology reduce their own drive numbers to not include the Pro drives, which is understandable, when you go to the third-party drives, once again, we look for the word Seagate, and this time we're only seeing eight drives maximum being listed, and that capacity still capping at 14 TB. Now, this limitation in storage compatibility goes one step further when you're looking at utilizing M2 NVMe bays. We touched on about it earlier on, where a lot of these modern Synology NASes arrive with SSD bays to use them for caching and storage. Now, only the more recent releases allow uh, utilization of these drives for uh, pools, but if we look at this more modern NAS, the 923, go back into that storage manager there, go into the drives, we've got two SSDs. We've got one of Synology's own SSDs and we've got a verbatim 1TB M2 NVMe SSD there. Now, what can we do with these drives? Well, if we try to create SSD cache, we can go ahead, we'll go for read only caching, so we only need one drive. We'll go for that next one, and we can use either of those drives. It doesn't limit us, it doesn't stop us. Of course, if we try to use it and we try to combine those drives, it may warn us once again we're using drives not on the compatibility list. But still, nevertheless, we can use it for caching. However, if we want to create an M2 NVMe storage pool instead, so we go here, we select NVMe drives, we're going for a single drive for a pool, you'll see that we've only seen one drive. It will not allow us to see that other drive and use it for that storage pool there. And the same goes if you go in reverse and try to look at that drive on its own and see what you can do with that managing available drive, there's no way to utilize that drive for a storage pool there. And the same goes if you go to the compatibility listings, go towards the list of M2 SSDs, they only list their own drives. And storage pools can only be done currently with their own drives. So this Odd position on compatibility on hard drives and SSDs in DSM 7.2 is winding people up and it may be one of the reasons you might want to go and not want to go for DSM. That's just the way it is. Now another thing a lot of people may not know about Synology DSM 7 is although it's available on pretty much all of the current generation of Synology NAS systems and indeed any NAS within the last five, maybe even six years, DSM is not equal on all systems. I've split screen here because if we open up the control panel on these two NASs and have a little deeper look and go to the info center on both of them, what you'll notice is the NAS on the left is a DS920 that's running on an Intel Celeron processor, whereas the one on the right is a DS223 NAS and it's running on a Realtek ARM processor. Now the result is between these two NAS is that some features and services are simply not going to be available and maybe one of the reasons you were looking at DSM or one of the things I mentioned earlier in the video you were like yeah cool I'm going to jump on a Synology NAS. If you go for some of the more affordable systems you're not going to get those apps and services. So if we go to the app center on both of these NAS systems and try to get them to uh, size up equally there you'll be able to see that although they're very, very similar in uh, the applications and services that are supported, they certainly don't arrive with support of this of similar level of apps. So, for example, certain key, uh, arguably more business class applications are going to be absent immediately. If we go to the all packages, we're not going to see active backup. So all of that highfalutin synchronization and backup and multi-site and VM backup tools, none of those are available on the more value series devices. If we go further down and we look at things such as the virtual machine manager, here that is not going to be possible on these more affordable NAS systems. It's not available. It's not visible. 
And although some cool things are there, such as the metadata scraping in video station, utilizing the AI photo recognition in Tonology Photos, a lot of these things are available, not all of them are. And there are certainly some key applications that are not available on some versions of DSM or more value series NASes as they are on more expensive or more powerful NAS. Same goes for surveillance station. Although that is available on both of them, it has to be said you will run fewer cameras on surveillance station on an ARM-based NAS than you will on an Intel or AMD x86-based NAS. But the differences don't stop there. If we were to try to create ourselves a new storage area on both of these systems, another thing you may notice very early on, so if we go ahead and try and create our new storage pool on both of these devices, we'll create a new storage pool there, a new storage pool there, and we flick through each of the individual options, you will notice an early difference between them almost immediately. So we'll go there, we'll select that there, select that drive there. We're almost certainly going to see the same warning on both of them. We've got the drive check, and we can create the RAID. That's good, right? That's all the same. However, once we go to create a volume, which is the bit where your data is actually going to live, that's when we see a difference let's flick to the other nas to create that volume to show you what i mean let's go there create ourselves that volume if we put the volume creation next to each other we have got that storage pool there super annoying let's go for it i think it'll be easier if i just explain on the left hand side here rather than go through that all again for you let's create our storage area there with that volume you won't get support of BTRFS on uh, value series NASes in some cases unless they've got, I believe it's one gig of memory now. It used to be two gig, but I think it's one. But the other thing you might move, miss out on is encryption of volumes. You can't encrypt volumes on the value series NAS, only on x86 and higher, uh, say the plus series and above NASes support this feature. Finally, while we're talking about features they both have um, differently, one of them is, of course, those immutable backups that I talked about earlier on. So if we create ourselves a new shared folder on both of these systems, and again, not a folder, we want a shared folder. On that new shared folder, if we call this one test1, one, call this one test1, one, again, it looks the same, right? We'll go to the next option, and crucially, you don't have write once, read many on the ARM based NAS. So those immutable backup options that we mentioned earlier on, where you can maintain data for longer, be protected from the effective ransomware changes that might encrypt your data, and all of those extras are not available on value series or ARM powered NASs. So just bear in mind that although Synology DSM looks incredibly similar on uh, these two NASes side by side, and they both run DSM 7.2. There are limitations in DSM on those value series NASes, which mean as much as you might want to go for a Synology NAS because of all the good things I said about DSM, bear in mind that not all of those things are available on all systems. Next up, another criticism a few users have had for Synology, and particularly in every recent release of DSM over the last few years, from DSM 7 to 7.1 and 7.2, is scaling back on USB support. Now, I already talked about earlier on how you can mount USB drives pretty darn easily. You can use the Virtual Machine Manager if you choose to create and assign USB devices to a Virtual Machine very, very easily, but... When it comes to utilizing other third-party devices that may include USB dongles, that may include uh, TV adapters, Bluetooth dongles, USB printers, office devices, and other USB-supported devices outside of storage and UPSs, now... They are not available anymore, and you're not going to be able to utilize those in most cases. You can assign or use uh, assign some of these for virtual machines and containers, and there are unsupported scripts you can get on the likes of GitHub that will allow you to use USB to 2.5 and 5 gig adapters, but none of these are officially supported. And now when you go to the compatibility list of most of these devices, you can't even see the option anymore. Only USB storage devices. And even then, that list is not exactly rigorously maintained. 
for USB storage given there are so many in the market. Yes, we could argue Synology would have to spend a million squillion years compatibly checking USBs and people have to submit them, but nevertheless, although they argue that the reason they removed USB compatibility beyond UPSs and storage was for security purposes, I would still say there are a lot of users, particularly those that would have enjoyed greater than gigabit USB adapters to be supported on these devices that are going to be a bit disappointed with the lack of USB compatibility across a myriad of peripherals and devices in DSM 7.2. This next point is one that may have become increasingly clearer throughout the course of the second half of this video, but when it comes to Synology's cloud platform C2, as good as it is, and I genuinely do think it is a great platform, I'm not overly keen on how often we're seeing Synology C2 as the platform of choice for off-site services and not third-party ones. Now, this all started for me when Hybrid Share was first rolled out, and this was to give you the ability to bolt on cloud storage so we had the appearance of local in your system. It meant that you could utilize all of that myriad of applications and services on your Synology NAS, all those tools on that cloud storage space, which is incredibly great, but it only supports their own C2 storage platform. You can't utilize a third party platform. You can't bolt on you know, your bog standard Google Drive storage. You can't go to the higher end AWS um, type storage there. You can only use it in conjunction with their own storage. And although C2, you know, it's not too expensive. More on that in a second. And you know, first party cloud to go with your first party NAS with your first party ecosystem makes a lot of sense. I think there are going to be users out there that were hoping to use a lot of the apps and services I've discussed with their third party blob um, block level and massive, you know, hyperscale level cloud storage they've already got in place to create kind of an on prem solution with the Synology NAS and then find out that although they've got access to the likes, of um, active backup to synchronize with the SAAS stuff. They've got access to hyper backup to synchronize a lot of that data space or cloud sync at a lower level to synchronize with those cloud spaces there. If they've got, if they wanted to go for some of the enterprise tools, they are locked behind Synology's own storage platform only. And although some of these services and applications within C2 are either free, licenseless, or not related to storage, such as the password manager tool and identity tools, it should be stated that some of the more impressive tools, such as Active Insight for the multi-site overview and some of their upcoming uh, cloud view applications that allow you to view a lot of these storage things on an overview, the cloud manager tools, they're all locked behind their own ecosystem cloud. When we look at C2 backup storage there, we look at the pricing, it's not overtly expensive, but it's not fantastic when you compare it to the likes of Google and more, which you may already have a long-term subscription for. I mean, yes, you can sign up for the trial. It's a 30-day trial for you to try out some space, but still, nevertheless, a lot of users are disappointed they can't use their own existing third-party cloud storage, similar to this data center level of off-site with a, some of these apps and services. One of the you know keen examples, other than, as mentioned, that uh, utilization of hybrid share is Synology C2 uh, backup, Synology C2 surveillance backup, to be precise, the option to have those cameras recording to that NAS, and those recordings also getting sent to that surveillance. You can't utilize your third-party cloud. Now, there'll be some of you there that will go, yes, you can. Why don't you just use some of those fantabulous applications that you just talked about to connect it with your cloud storage, with cloud sync, with hyper backup? And that's true. You can do that. But none of them are as instantaneous as that of C2 surveillance, which you can only use with C2. It's just a shame that you can't point another cloud provider in that area of C2 surveillance there. And of course, there is an additional fee there on top to utilize those. Yes, you can integrate that into your existing C2, but nevertheless, 
they do come with a charge to use that service. And yes, there is a trial, and yes, there are ways and means to get around it. And of course, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they are developing these platforms in-house to remain single ecosystem, and therefore, they need to see a return on investment and to maintain that single ecosystem. But nevertheless, if you are someone that was hoping to use Synology in conjunction with your existing third-party large-scale cloud storage, bear in mind that not all of the apps and features I've discussed are going to be available to integrate with that third party cloud. That's just the way it is. Finally, let's return to the subject of Surveillance Station. And Surveillance Station, as good as it was, and I did mean every single bit of praise that I highlighted about this application in terms of its usability, its features, and more. It's worth highlighting that there are a couple of very key features that are advertised by Synology for this platform that are not going to be available to everyone out of the box. What am I talking about? I am talking about some of the AI-based applications. And although there is features such as person recognition, such as uh, vehicle recognition, license plate recognition, and more, all of which are supported in Surveillance Station, you are going to need to either purchase one of Synology's own cameras in order to take advantage of um, person recognition um, and vehicle recognition and drawing lines and safeguards in a uh, much more uh, kind of strategic fashion but on top of that if you want to have facial recognition in a database vehicle databases and running large amounts of tasks you're going to have to go for much more expensive NASs like the DVA 3221 and the 16 to two from Synology. Now, and if you are a member of the um, NASCAR Pits Inner Circle, you'll already know about this, but we've been running a few different videos in the background off the channel, including the Ask Me Anything Zoom a while ago, but the other video we ran in advance, because it will be coming out on the channel later, is a comparison of what exactly is available on NAS with AI recognition, um, cameras that have got um, video and uh, sorry um, AI recognition built in, and Synology NASs that have neither. Now, all of those videos you should be able to check out, and hopefully I'll link to them in the description. But the overall takeaway is that as good as Surveillance Station in is, and as much as Synology hype it up, it is incredibly important to know that there are AI supported services that are not possible on all Synology NASs, even though the hardware would probably be able to do it, such as the DVA-16 to, to here, which has got exactly the same CPU, by the way, as this NAS here, the DS920+. Plus. Nevertheless, if you're looking at Synology and this surveillance platform, just bear in mind that some of those kind of higher end apps and services are not going to be possible on every NAS. And much like we talked about with DSM running on an ARM-based NAS, if Synology advertised that it's in DSM, they're not lying, but at the same time, you're gonna to have to make sure you have the specific right NAS to get the job done. And there you go. This has been my before you buy on Synology DSM 7.2. Did I miss things? Of course, even a video this length, there's always going to be things I missed. And frankly, within DSM, there are so many more benefits that we could talk about. Indeed, when I did my DSM 7.1 review that went on for almost two hours, where we covered everything, there was still gaps. Everything from the security protocol to the mobile apps that you can utilize, different files and features that you can utilize, and ultimately the full scope of what DSM can do. But the big takeaway you need in this before you buy and review at DSM 7.2 is quite simply that right now in the world of NAS, DSM is still the best NAS or software in the market right now. Is it perfect? No. There are limitations when it comes to customization, and Synology are most certainly uh, building their own singular ecosystem and choosing creatively and I would say tactically what third party tools, hardware and software they want to work with and otherwise they build their own tools around it but you've got to give them credit for it because what they do works. On top of that it's responsive. If that's one thing you want to take throughout the course of this video although it's taken me two two and a half hours to record I'm sure you can see the time at the bottom 
it has to be said that it has been responsive and when I've been running all of these things from two different NASes here I've not been using high-end Xeons I've been using one NAS that's a dual core Ryzen AMD embedded server processor and the other one is a Celeron but still nonetheless these two NAS systems have been able to run everything that I've thrown at it throughout the course of this and you need to take that on board so if you are looking for a NAS that shuts up and does what it's told if you're looking for a complete software and hardware solution and if you're looking for a nas that does what it says on the tin you really are not going to be able to find much better than Synology's dsm platform just remember it is crafted around a, a beautiful looking but very rigid structure and if you're looking for customization and flexibility there may be times the more technically versed will find the Synology platform a little more limiting. But overall, if you're looking for the most easy, user-friendly platform in the market, it is unquestionably DSM 7.2. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I know it's been a bit of a long-running video, but I hope I covered all of the bases for you. Let me know what you think in the comments. <clears throat> Slowly losing my voice. Shocker, right? If you have enjoyed this video please use the links in the description to go to any e shop that we've got listed in order to get hold of anything you need for storage one it won't cost you anything extra and two using those links passively support me and eddie it's just here us here at nas compares and it helps us keep doing what we do but more importantly if you need free support and advice use the free advice section over on nas compares you go to the right hand side of any one of our pages and on the right hand side of the page you will find the free advice button which you can head into and fill out a questionnaire to get questions otherwise you can head over to our ko-fi section where from there you can look into getting priority support from us alternatively you can go for the services to get a free consultation from myself where i can guide you through the best solution and the best setup for your needs other than that you can head over to our membership program where you can get free advice get invited to our monthly zooms get invited into the inner circle and ultimately be just more informed about your purchase and long-term data storage support and of course with the inner circle you get access to exclusive videos like our ask me anything recording that went on for about i think an hour and a half to two hours and access to the monthly zooms that we run here in the background and exclusive access to the videos we run on the channel but apart from that thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time